Hi there everyone, here is part two of our talk about the Gaia Hypothesis. And in this video we're going to think about why Lovelock and his supporters are so sure about this theory and why that may have an effect on all of our lives in the not too distant future. So if we're going to talk about why people believe a theory, we need to talk about evidence. Daisy World is a nice metaphor, a nice thought experiment, but it doesn't really give us any proof that that is really what is happening. In 50 years, Lovelock and others have suggested many things as evidence for the theory, but here are three of the biggest proposals. The temperature of the Earth has stayed almost the same even though the sun gives out more than 25 25% more energy than when life first began. There are always natural variations in temperature up and down of course but not on the level of this increase in the star's output. The salt in the oceans has remained fairly constant, even though salt is washed down into the ocean all the time, and it stays there, left behind when water evaporates back through the water cycle. The sea should be getting saltier, but it isn't. Why not? Because, says Lovelock, Gaia, or the natural organisms which form part of Gaia, will remove it to help sustain life in the oceans. And finally, the atmospheric composition should be unstable. Gases like methane and oxygen are not naturally held in the atmosphere. They will react with things and they will be lost. Biological processes need to replace them, especially oxygen, which is 20% of the atmosphere. And this is an example that we are going to look at as an indicator of how Gaia works and how her feedback systems work. So let's go back to a time before mankind and a volcano erupted somewhere on Earth. And what that meant is a large amount of CO2 was released into the atmosphere. Now this might sound like bad news, but for the plants it was good news. More CO2 in the atmosphere meant that more plants could grow more quickly. So this is Gaia in action. More plants mean more carbon dioxide is absorbed and through the processes of photosynthesis that CO2 is transformed into O2 which is then released back into the atmosphere. So what this does is it means that all of that carbon dioxide that was released by the volcanoes is removed from the atmosphere and that the carbon dioxide level is brought back down again. Do not mistake the size of those clouds for the actual values of the amounts of gases. Oxygen is around 20% of the atmosphere and CO2 is around 0.03% of the atmosphere. However, the balance, the equilibrium between the two gases is restored. So you might also remember that there was a time when O2 was not a balanced part of the atmosphere and when it came with the oxygen revolution it killed many of the organisms that were then living. So that was a different biosphere and a different version of Gaia. So this is one of Gaia's feedback systems, there are many more. We have CO2. If CO2 goes up, then that allows plants to absorb more CO2 and bring it back down again. And that in turn allows more oxygen to be produced, which is better for the animals than the plants. This is one way that Gaia regulates the Earth, although I want to make a note of caution. When I talk about Gaia doing things, I don't want to make you think that this is some kind of conscious decision. There is no real Earth Goddess. This is why the name has sometimes been problematic. It's not about someone deciding to regulate the Earth like a machine. It's more like your heart beating or your lungs working. You don't tell them to do what they do, they just work. 
So you might think now that global warming is not a problem. If man produces more carbon dioxide like the volcanoes, then Gaia will just grow more plants and the balance can be restored just like before. There is, however, a but. And it is a big but. Gaia needs to grow more plants to balance the CO2. The problem is humans are destroying plants and other natural systems faster than Gaia can regrow them. And this is ultimately the real and perhaps the biggest problem of the environment. We are actively stopping Gaia from doing her job. And unfortunately for us, her job is keeping us alive. And what this leads us on to is another part of the theory, the revenge of Gaia. This is a new facet to the hypothesis, which is not a very welcome one. I warn you now, the next few minutes are going to be pretty scary in some ways. In 2006, Lovelock wrote The Revenge of Gaia. This is a book in which he says that man has now caused too much damage to the biosphere and Gaia cannot cope. The only way for Gaia to survive is for her to reduce the population on Earth, specifically the human population, the species that is causing the most damage. We have just passed 7 billion people in the world and if Lovelock is to be believed, a lot of them are going to die when the revenge of Gaia takes its course. So according to Lovelock, by the year 2050, although some people say it will be a little later than that, but in all our lifetimes the population of Earth will be hugely reduced by famine, floods, droughts and other environmental disasters. He says most of Southeast Asia will be desert and people will not be able to live there. People will be fighting to get into countries like Canada, Australia and Britain, where at the cooler latitudes you will have more ability to continue to grow food. There is some suggestion the Sahara Desert may spread as far as Paris in northern France. Every summer in Europe will be a heat wave. So living in Europe or northern Europe, France and Germany will become like living in North Africa now. This is a problem for the heat, but also because it's going to be more difficult to grow food crops. So let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine if we wanted to half the population of the world, a 50% reduction in just 50 years. How would that look politically? Well, you may remember the 9-11 attacks on America. That was an event that left 3,000 people dead. Imagine if that happened every 24 minutes, something like that happened, or perhaps a shape of things to come, the tsunami that struck Asia in 2004, a quarter of a million people died. Imagine if that happened every single day for the next 50 years. Something local to Thailand, in 2011 floods killed 300 people. Now, this was a much lower level of flooding than the tsunami, but imagine if that was happening every two and a half minutes. All those people died every two and a half minutes. And on top of this, Lovelock says that the reduction may be much worse than that. 80% reduction of the world's population. He says if we want to live in the high energy way we do now, the Earth cannot sustain more than a billion people. And he says that that reduction is going to happen in this century. So there's a term that Lovelock's popularized called sustainable retreat. Many politicians like to use the words sustainable development when talking about the future of mankind on the planet. Lovelock argues that it is 
far too late for that. He says the goal now should be to ramp down human activity to a more reasonable level of energy use. He says that what we should be thinking about is trying to save as much of the biosphere as we can. So Lovelock cannot be certain that this is what is going to happen, but he has spent 50 years working on this theory. Some people disagree with him, however. Some people say it's bad, but not that bad. And a few people are ignoring the problem altogether. Whatever happens, I think it is clear that we need to do our best to understand exactly how Gaia works, because she is the only world we have. And if the biosphere gets compromised in some way and is unable to support the biodiversity of life, well, that's going to give us very serious problems and if Lovelock is correct it's going to give us problems very very soon. So on that rather depressing note I think we will leave it. I'd like to inject a brief note of optimism. Necessity is the mother of invention as they say and we might find solutions to some or even all of these problems sometime in the future and it's going to require an awful lot of work and an awful lot of political and social will to change the way we live.